You're listening to the Wedding Biz Network, the voice of the creative entrepreneur. Hey everyone, it's Andy Kushner with The Wedding Biz, a podcast that provides both education and inspiration for those of us in or interested in the weddings and events industry. And wow, is it a busy time right now in October. I hope that all of you are having great success and able to keep up and stay on top of everything and yet at the same time have somewhat of a balanced lifestyle. Well, maybe not till later in the year. Anyway, if you missed last week's episode, it was a revisit of an amazing interview with an incredible lighting designer, Roy Thompson out of Los Angeles. I highly, highly recommend you listen to that interview. It will give you a completely different perspective on lighting design and what you can do with events. Today's guest is Victoria Dubin of Victoria Dubin Events located out of New York City. I remember meeting Victoria many years ago and being really impressed with her work and wanting to get her on the show. Well, after graduating from Cornell University, she began her career in finance and real estate. Later, she was the owner of a successful gift and home design accessories business, and eventually Victoria started a highly sought-after event planning firm. Victoria Dubin Events offers a full scope of services for social, weddings, corporate, and nonprofit events, both in New York City and everywhere else. Enjoy this conversation with Victoria Dubin. Hey, Vicky, it's so good to have you on the show. I don't know if you remember, but we met like, God, 15 years ago or somewhere. I know we met. I remember. It was some event. We do. I meet a lot of amazing people and your face looks very familiar for the few minutes that we got to uh, get acquainted just now. Yeah, I think it was probably special events or or ILEA or back then as it was called ISIS and then they had to change it. Um, I think it was that. But, you know, the way I'd like to start is... Is there anything about your upbringing that influenced who you are today as an event planner and designer? Did you have any clue that you'd be getting into this when you were a little girl? That's a really good question. So growing up, my family was in the entertainment um, business. So we always had a tremendous amount of um, people socializing at family get togethers. And they were quite often like even several times a week. Um, My grandmother uh, was one of six and she had four sisters and they all sang um, and played the piano and were great chefs and cooks and invited people over um, for, you know, casual Sunday night barbecues pretty much on a regular basis and were very gracious in terms of entertaining and casual and easygoing and anybody could come at the last minute it was always, there was music, there was always beautiful china and decor and floral and just a lot of merriment. Um, so I grew up where entertaining was not a hassle. It wasn't a big deal. It was always gracious. And it was a way of life more than it was a career path, but it was what came natural. And then um, as I got older, I was probably one of the first college students to have dinner parties and invite people over instead of all of us running to a club or a bar or a party, I would make dinner parties and set beautiful tables and call my grandmother for recipes um, back in the day. So entertaining was always a way of life. And I was always very well known as um, an entertainer way prior to getting involved in this industry. And I know that you graduated from Cornell University. You began your career in finance and real estate. You owned a successful gift and home design accessories business. You threw all these parties. So it's it's interesting to me, you know, when I have people on the show that had some kind of history in their family like you do, that it then manifested in this way. I love that kind of a story. Yeah, well, it's what comes natural. I think the most successful um, planners, designers, producers in this industry are people who are very, very comfortable entertaining large groups of people and very at ease with the concept of entertaining because many of our clients don't have that. So the reason they seek out our services is because they don't have that confidence and that comfort um, and the ability to do it and it makes them very anxious. So if you have somebody with experience and comfort and an ease about them, it puts the client at ease, which I think people very much um, appreciate. Yeah. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Well, you know, in your website, when I looked through it, um, there was a quote there that I want to get into. You said, we believe that every celebration should be an individual expression of who you are. Our client's vision, personality, lifestyle, and taste are reflected in all that we do. 
Can you take me, Vicky, through some of your like your your general process from when you first meet with a wedding client and through the event? You know, in order to reflect that personality. You know, how how do you do that? Generally speaking. So let me um, tell you what I mean by that. We are all capable of of throwing very lavish, beautiful um, events. I think what I'm well known for is more of a bespoke experience, a more custom experience. Um, I. If you look at Instagram, you look at my website, the similarity of my events is the preciseness and just the sensibility um, from an aesthetic and a flow point of view. But what makes them so different from week to week is I really, really, really try to get to know my clients. And I ask them a lot of questions about lifestyle and travel and things that are of interest to them, whether they're art collectors um, whether they love interior design, um, whether they're sports fanatics, play a sport, anything that's a commonality of our brides and grooms, where they met, what they like to do together. I think the more you can infuse a party with that moment when guests arrive and they start smiling and saying, this is so them, makes their party feel more special. Like each and every week we have that ability reinvent ourselves. And I've been hearing that because, you know, I'm sure like most of the planners right now, um, we've been week to week to week, you know, since the pandemic's over. And people are often commenting to me that they can't get over how each week it looks so different. Um, Professionally, for me, I prefer that because then the process is super exciting to plan and I my ideas remain fresh and I'm enthusiastic. I don't like to repeat a party if there's an element. I mean, as I said, the precision it is what the constant is there, but in terms of the inspiration, the design and everything else about it, I like each and every event to be about my clients. And then they lean on me to go into the pool of incredible resources within the event community to pull the best talent to get them what this individual's expression really is. Yeah, I love that. Well, what about, you know, in terms of how you come up with your ideas, you know, for the creative side of this? I mean, is it something like, are you waking up in the middle of the night writing down ideas? Are you putting yourself in some kind of environment? Like, like, is there some general way that you get inspired after you have those meetings with those clients? I mean, my brain is always like thinking, I mean, I'm pretty much completely monofocused on um, my business throughout the day. I'm past the point of raising kids. I don't have very many distractions. So my clients and their events really are foremost on my mind. I I do a lot of research, whether it be on the internet or I, I read, um, I speak to them a lot. I'm constantly exploring. I, I'm a avid walker. I walk like eight miles a day. So they're very productive walks. I mean, if you ever are Working with me, I'm often out of breath because I'm always exercising um, as I'm talking to my clients, but those are really productive walks and they're in nature and they're beautiful. And whether it be the greenery, I, I had a walk yesterday with somebody and they said, can you you know, look at the branches on the trees and how they're hanging? So there's often reference. I, I live near a beach. I, I walk and see the water. So often, even through just daily activities, um, I'm able to think and spend some time, whether it be in nature or an environment, or I often go to art galleries and there's just something I see, whether it be a color scheme or um, some kind of technique. And um, I say, you know, I've got to do this at a time. So there's often note taking in my brain just through everyday experiences and restaurants I eat in or travel, whatever it is that get stored. I take a ton of pictures. My phone is always out. I'm always taking pictures. So I have certainly a very, very good access to everything I've seen before. And it's my uh, Wikipedia. You know, it's interesting that you talk about the walks and how you get so inspired because I've always done that and hiking, but especially in, especially in the beginning when the pandemic hit, I took tons of walks and I would put on, you know, music in my earbuds and I would get so many inspirations. And to this day, I think it, walking is meditative. I mean, and, and that's where I get a ton of ideas. I'm always having to stop and, you know, type them into my phone. I mean, I re- really resonate with that. Yeah, I'm a tremendous multitasker. I mean, and probably when you're with me, I literally just had a very big phone call with a bride and groom. I was driving, I was at the bank, I was um, getting an iced coffee. And the entire time I was staying completely focused and being very aware of my environment. It's just something that I have. And I'm sure everybody in this business says they're multitaskers. But even if I'm very, very, very focused on something, I will see and be aware of everything around me at the same time. My brain can do 
things at once. So, you know, also when we were uh, planning to to do this interview, this conversation, you had talked about um, your perspective on collaborative approaches with competitors, you know, collaborating with several competitive planners. Now you said, I would love to hear more about that. So let me tell you a little bit of how that came about. Well, first of all, you know, pre-pandemic, we were all very fortunate in the industry that there are so many industry events and whether it be conferences um, for the industry where we all really get to know one another and um, including other planners and what would have been competitors, um, you know, they still are, you know, the, the good news about competition in this business is that there's enough business for everybody. And um, I always think the right planning team gets the right assignment. I mean, there are many of us who could easily be the planner on a job somebody else gets, but fortunately, you know, there's many, many people who want to do something, you know, each and every weekend. And we, for the most part, can be booked as much as we want. So the community of planners is quite friendly. You know, yes, you're disappointed if you hear another planner gets it over you. But for the most part, I've become very, very friendly with the clients. And we all, I mean, pardon the other planners, and we all support one another. You know, we need one another to make sure that our responses to clients are the same or frustrations with vendors or what's going on in the world right now. So we, collaborate a lot even prior to my working with them and just supporting one another and getting information from one another and finding out the best way to structure our contracts. So over the years, even prior to this, there was tremendous amount of time I spent with um, other planners. And um, even to this date, I mean, given my choice, I would go on vacation with many of my colleagues who are my competitors because they really are the people that I have the most in common with. So let's start with that as a premise. What happened um, sort of pre-pandemic and post-pandemic is that, you know, some of our parties are more complex and we all have our staff, but sometimes it requires a different expertise that perhaps, you know, a, an employee doesn't have or a support or an assistant doesn't have. And you really need to support the client in a very significant way. And some of our parties have becoming quite complex. So we have offered our client the ability to have more than one planner on the job. So it's a very transparent conversation. I speak to the client, I find out what's involved. And then I say how I run my business. I said, I have my team, but I often collaborate with another planner with their team. And together we'll bring um, different perspectives, but we work together. And what I've liked about it is that you don't have to micromanage the process. When you're hiring another expert to do it, you could kind of let go. And just say, okay, you've got this, I've got this. So you split and conquer sort of the various elements of the party and you each take on those components that you feel your expertise and your personality and your style best complements servicing the job. So I have um, been working very hard meeting other planners that I can do this with on a more formal basis. So right now, in the last two years, I've probably collaborated with five planners and their team to produce parties. And the clients do know there's nothing, you know, there's no false information given. And they quite like it because they have tremendous confidence going into their event that they have a team of experts. Um, and it's never like, when it was just my business, you know, a lot of people just wanted my opinion. Like, what did Vicky say? What does Vicky want? You know, and as much as they trust our teams, they always want our point of view. And now with this arrangement, they can let go and say, well, I spoke to so-and-so about this and um, great, we're covered there. So I very much believe in this and it's something I am going to continue um, to cultivate and really develop it into a strong business model going forward. You know, there's often not a succession plan in our business. I mean, we work very hard, but it's not like an entity we have to sell at some point. Right, right. It's you. It's all about you. You know, and that's wonderful, but a successful person has something to pass on afterwards. And so I feel that this is a business model that will allow me as, you know, time goes on to find a great way to stay in this business and um, feel like you know, very much added value, but making better use of my time and my expertise and servicing a client base that maybe isn't quite as onerous to me personally, you know, as time goes on. But is it a certain kind of event that lends itself to you wanting to have a collaborative approach with another planner? I mean, is it like ultra lux? Is it some high end budget? I mean, how do you determine when you need to? Well, certainly those 
to yes, I mean, because if it's a destination and it's five days and you know, you need a bit, but it's also um, multiple events in one day. So in certain cases, I'm already booked when I get a phone call, but it's a great client. I, I've done previous events for them. They want me to stay. So I stay involved in a consulting capacity, but I get them a team that will produce it weekend of where I may not be able to be there, but it's not at the expense of anything with um, the success of the event. So that's part of it. So it's, yes, it's complexity. And it's also just the pure magnitude of events we have right now and the quantity of events. Um, It's a way of not turning down business and forming, you know, whether it be a finance firm, an insurance firm, um, there are many, many businesses that are structured with multiple um, VIPs that work collaboratively and um, cooperatively. And even if they're competitors, there's room for more than one people under an umbrella. So it would be really an umbrella of planners that work under a collaborative approach. Just so I follow, how does it compare to planners who have these other planners who are working for them? I mean, I, I, obviously, it's different from that. It's a, just a different approach. So you could decide, like, I could go out tomorrow and hire 10 people to work under me. But you know, then I have to report to them every single day. This way, like when I work with a, another company, they manage their team. They manage their responsibilities. And it's, um, you know, even from an overhead point of view, you don't need big offices. You don't. People can work independently. People could work at home. I mean, you can communicate by email, texting telephone calls. So it's just a, there are many people that prefer to keep hiring more people as their business gets busy. And perhaps 15 years ago, that might've been an approach. Um, At this juncture of my life, it's not an interest I have right now to have a tremendous um, amount of people working for me. You know, I like the independence and I like if, you know, perhaps it's not a very busy day and I want to take a day and go to art galleries in the city. I don't have a team of 10 people you know, working and sort of waiting for directive from me. So this just works out quite well. And I think that I have the ability, I have a very, very, very large network of people that I know personally and people who love my expertise. It gives me the ability to avail myself to people and to events. And perhaps if it was just me personally taking a party, it might be one fee structure. But if I can put together a team for them that's more within their aligned budget and I can still overall watch it and consult on it, there's another niche. Now, everyone doesn't have to be like um, a major, major event. So it just gives me a little more flexibility um, in terms of the um, events, the number of events I can do during the year and what my involvement in each event is. Yeah, I love how you're talking about this. And I think you're on the cutting edge because I I am only, I mean, you know, I've had this show, The Wedding Biz, for five years. I've talked to an enormous amount of planners and designers and and other industry pros. And I'm just starting to hear this. It's really interesting that this is coming up just recently. I mean, so I th- I think it's a great idea. And, and especially, look, you've been doing this for what, over 20 years, right? 25, something like that, more than that even? I came into this business um, almost 30 years ago. I, I mean, and, you know, I was one of those cliche stories where I um, made my own social event. At the time, it was my son's bar mitzvah. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of people to lean on. There were the florists and they weren't called designers back then. They were strictly called florists and they were the entertainment people. And I kind of needed some support because, you know, I had three kids and I had another business at the time, this gift business, and I didn't really have time and I didn't even know there was such things as somebody you could hire to assist with all the elements of it. So once I understood, and I'm a quick study of most experiences in my life, I said, wow, this seems to be a very big niche, certainly with the people I know. And, uh, you know, it's been my son's bar mitzvah, but that was the start of probably hundreds of bar mitzvahs within the community I live because everybody has multiple kids. And I saw a niche that people needed the support and needed to lean on somebody. And, you know, I sort of made up the business very initially as I went along until it really became a big business. But it wasn't like one day I decided to be an event planner. It sort of happened. I made my own event and somebody said, oh, my God, I love that. Can you help me with mine? And it started with a bunch of friends. And I just sort of helped as a friend. And then all of a sudden, their family and sisters and sister-in-laws were calling me. And then their sister-in-law's friends started to call me. And then another person heard of it. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to give up everything else I'm doing and I'm going to predominantly do this. And I grew up in this industry, you know, with all 
you know, the people that are still like what we call now, you know, the most seasoned people, you know, sort of from um, an age group um, and an experience point of view, but I'm probably one of the longer standing people in this business right now. I mean, I could, you know, rattle off about a dozen, two dozen people that have been in this as long as I've been in it. Um, now it's filled with all sorts of incredibly um, amazing young people and new talent. And I've seen them all at these events. And that's sort of part of my philosophy is I'm sort of studying the way they do things. And I'm seeing the difference between sort of the old way we used to do this and the experience and the newer way with whether it's kids coming out of college or other jobs or other work experiences and sort of their approach. And I think there's a happy medium between the way we used to do things and the way things are being done now. And this little model I'm talking about avails people, I think the best of everything because they get our experience and they get our elegance and our um, respect to procedure. And, you know, it's not just about flow sheets and Excel breakdowns and precision and nice little pretty packages of paper that, you know, the younger group of planners right now, you know, send out. And um, interesting enough, um, somebody had asked me weeks ago, do you share your um, list of responsibilities in a form and, you know, put in paper everything you do? It's like, well, we do everything. What do you need to see? Right. And the scope of services is now like a big fancy document that a lot of the younger planners have, you know, all sorts of great collateral material. And, you know, we're sort of old school, like get on the phone and I'll tell you what I do. So, you know, I've learned now I have to adapt some of that into what I do. But now I have also um, younger people working with me in the business. So they support what is needed, perhaps in I'm much happier just picking up the phone and talking to people than the emails and, you know, texting and all that. Yeah. I want to make sure that you're aware of two other shows that are on the Wedding Biz Network. First, The Business of Being Creative, hosted by founder and president of The Business of Being Creative, Sean Lowe. Sean's consulting firm is focused on providing practical advice to those in the business of being creative. Tune in every Tuesday to hear a new episode chock full of topics and advice for creative businesses. Also, check out the two seasons of Stop and Smell the Roses, hosted by the one and only lifestyle and event design expert, Preston Bailey. Preston speaks with such an honest voice, I know you're going to thoroughly enjoy hearing him on this unique platform. You can find both shows at theweddingbiznetwork.com or on your cell phone's podcast app for both The Business of Being Creative and stop and smell the roses. Do you have any kind of an exit strategy at this point? I mean, I'm, I'm asking this because, I mean, I'm also, I'm like in my 32nd year in the music and entertainment side of things. You know, you've been doing it 30 plus years. Uh, do you think about that, Vicky? I mean... Often. So I have, um, you know, great, um, I have a daughter and a daughter-in-law and... Um, you know, they're both very successful in their careers right now. My daughter supports a lot of what I do. She works for me on weekends. We've been given a lot of thought. Um, so she acts as a project manager on quite a lot of my events right now. Um, I have an idea in place that I think if she was to join me at some point, um, which is in active conversation right now, I think there's another way of doing this business without you having to give your entire life to it, which the rest of us have done forever. <laughs> right, right. Part of this is this business formula I'm speaking to you about. And I think there's ways of having better boundaries and a better work environment. And it doesn't have to be you wake up and you put in a 22-hour day in order to be successful. Um, somebody told me a very, very long time ago, you'll never have a successful business unless you su surround yourself and support yourself with many people that you can delegate to. So I think the concept of um, managing a party and finding really incredibly talented people to delegate to is something that I can pass on to my kids if they want to, and um, they can develop their own way of doing this and maybe have an, a little bit of an easier life. The only question that I ask myself is, if my daughter was to do it, I happen to have gotten into this business in my 30s. I had my children quite young. And the kids today don't do that. It is a very, very, very big imposition on your personal life. And you have to have the right support in order to feel good about your life with the amount of time and energy we spend working. So that would be my succession plan is to 
continue to build this collaborative business model and perhaps bring my daughter or daughter-in-laws into this? And should they not be interested, then I would just continue to get my leads and um, stay involved in a consulting capacity for people and maybe hand it off to a planning team that would implement it. And people could hire me in a lesser capacity to sort of be the eyes on it or to be their support on, on their end to say, hey, Vicki, you know, can we look at these contracts together? I want to discuss the decor with you. What's your opinion on that? So I think the succession plan would be more consulting on my behalf as much as perhaps running this business with my kids. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I'm the way I'm dealing with it. One of the ways I thought I uh, about three years ago, I got a business partner. I mean, we're talking after 27, 28 years, something like that. I br- I got a business partner and I am loving it. And And I, you know, I feel that I have now a more balanced lifestyle and I'm able to just focus more on my strengths you know, and, and really focus more also on the brand and the creative side of things. He handles more the uh, the business, the administrative side, the financial side of it. And I feel like that, you know, I didn't think about this, Vicky, at the time. I wasn't thinking about exit strategy and all of that. I was just their succession plan. I was just, I just needed to uh, balance things out more. And, and again, I wanted to focus more of my time where I really enjoyed it as opposed to where I didn't. And what I'm realizing and also listening to you is that this could be another strategy for, uh, how to move on. You know, it, it's interesting. Well, this partnership idea, is just not a permanent partner, right? Each of my events, I have a partner pretty yeah, much. I understand that. Event. I get it. And yeah. I have the support I need per event. They're just not necessarily the same person each and every time there is definitely consistency with who I use. And I have um, project managers per party. So I get hired and I put the team together immediately. And that's the team that stays part of the party and they support it. Um, And there are many times they work together. Like, so, you know, let's say I don't have uh, two events in a day, then I'll put the whole team together. And so I'm also a huge introducer and a huge sharer. So there is nothing like secret about what I do. I'm very happy to give information to people and chat with people and there's no massive trade secrets I have. Uh, we all come to this business um, with a different expertise, another personality style that um, appeals, you know, to different clients. So I'm not, I'm a competitive person in that I like to be the best I can be at what I'm competitive with myself. Um, and I think competition keeps us on our toes, but I'm not a competitive um, person in terms of the spirit that has any negativity um, associated or insecurity associated with it. You know, I've done this for a long enough time and I'm a well-wisher for other people and I certainly admire other people's work. So none of that um, is a problem. So partnerships don't really threaten me, especially even if it's not permanent, um, because at some point you kind of know who you are, you know, in, in life and you know what you bring to the table. But To the point of what you said, I don't want a permanent one person partner. I'm not interested in that. No, I get that. But and I but I love what the the way you're talking about this. You know, also before we go, um, one more question. If you were mentoring a younger planner, planner designer, um, who either you know, either they're wanting to get in the business or they're in it, but they really want to get to that next level, like what is there anything really critical that you would say to them if you had to summarize it? Well, I think the most important thing um, is to understand your clients, spend the time speaking to them, get comfortable and get familiar with them and get friendly with them. And most important is about confidence that you really have their back. And then your responsibility then is to have equally those strong relationships within the industry. Find the people in the industry that have your same sensibility, that have your back that have um, your drive, your focus, um, and your dedication to the job, and then align yourself with the vendors that really work best for you. You're only as good as your vendors. And I say to people when they hire me, um, yes, you're hiring me for my expertise, but I'm an insurance policy because while your party is incredibly important to me and to you, um, you're one party of vendors that um, they do multiple parties a year. But I, as a client to the vendors, represent many, many parties a year. So I'm a very important client to my vendors. So that's something that's super important is that you tell your clients um, that they're hiring you for those relationships. So spend the time with people in the industry, 
find people that really represent the way you like to do business and put whatever energy you need to make that part of like your entire business model. Um, And then I think if you can manage the relationship with the clients and manage the vendors and then just be efficient and get the support, you know, the admin support and what you need, you'll have a very successful business. There's no shortcut. There's no um, kind of just winging this in this business. So, and if for some reason a vendor disappoints you, you can share with them what that is and you can make the decision if you want to invest time to get over sort of that upset or you move on because there's a lot of new talent, but you have to put the time and energy in. Um, Lastly, what I would say is to that point, don't get stuck with just using the same vendors. Force yourself to meet new people and, and give them a try and work with them because then you'll be fresh in the marketplace. You'll show your clients, you offer a variety um, of different approaches. So I think that's another lesson I would say to people, don't get stuck in a rut with just working with the same people. Mm, I like that. Yeah. Well, gosh, Vicki, this has been really wonderful. I, we, we covered a lot of territory in a short amount of time, and I've really been looking forward to this for a long time. So thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Thank you for reaching out and, and wanting to learn more about what we do. So I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Victoria Dubin. You could find her website at victoriadubin.com. Her last name is spelled D-U-B-I-N. Again, that's victoriadubin.com. And you can find her on Instagram at Victoria Dubin Events. Please check out the show notes at our website of theweddingbiz.com. And it would really be helpful if you can review the show and let other people know how much you like it so that they can also find it. And be sure to subscribe to The Wedding Biz Podcast so you know when new episodes are dropped. And you can find us on Instagram in particular at The Wedding Biz. And we'll catch you next week with a new episode.